The stories that we hear as children, the ones that cross ethnic and geographical boundaries, that jump ship and swim to the nearest lands searching for a vivid imagination to survive on, are the ones that stay with us. They scratch and claw and batter their way to the top, reigning unforgettable in some oft irrelevant corner of our minds. The story of Alice, a lost in Wonderland, of Pinocchio and his wooden nose, of the Pied Piper and his entrancing melodies. But there is truth to absurdity. A single kernel awaiting a jolt of curiosity fed flames to burst open, to throw away its pale veneer of fiction and bask in the sodden sunlight of reality. And so it was with the story of the Pied Piper of Hamelin. That strange, motley dotted figure that trapezed up to the country of a plague-stricken Germany and rid an entire village of its rats. When his payment was refused, he lifted his magic flute and played a tune that enchanted the minds of the children of the town and led them to their end. A fitting story that tells of the perils of reneging on a promise. But the Pied Piper was real. It was no man nor friendly magician that brought Hamelin to its knees. And there were no friendly tunes played on flutes past gabled tilth houses and cattle barns. What it was, I can only assume. And I hope that no man tries more than that. What I am about to tell you is information I only know through happenstance. Studying history at grade school has given me access to the archaeological museum in my city, which just so happened to have a cultural exchange with one of the largest centers of religious conservation in the world, based out of Berlin. An internship there brought me in touch with the book I am about to quote to you from, a journal maintained by a man of faith in the Church of St. John's, in what used to be Lower Saxony in 1284 AD. It was a moldy, near illegible mess of rot and flaky parchment. The once vivid emerald green linen that covered the pages was now a dirty, withering rag, with a single word sewn into it in flowery script. Bungalow Sinstrasse. The street without drums. It was this that caught my attention. A storybook-like title inscribed out of the cover of a church pastor's journal. I decided to take transcriptions of the text, translate it, and look into it further. If there was ever a mistake I had made in academia before, it paled before this one. I will now write down what I read there, skipping over the numerous dronings on virtue, sin, and hope. Father Adam, as he had signed the journal, was a true devout, a man of religious passion tempered with what seemed to be innate human understanding. I am only apologetic for what he had to endure. Faith will save many from a lot, but what is faith in the jaws of that which eludes human comprehension and law? That exists notwithstanding every edict of science and religion. There is none that can stand the terror of that which is beyond the realm of mortal comprehension. Father Adam, the 12th of June, 1284. St. John and Paul's festival draws ever so close, and the parish is festive. The orchards are in their last bloom before autumn, and the skies seem as spun cotton laid out on untouched seas. The tithe hold is full to bursting, but the year has been good and the small folk have enough to live by for the season. Winter will not be kind, but the Lord will watch his flock, and they'll receive his providence as strongly as will the king in his regal robes. The mayor has approached me today for confession, and I will hear him. He bears a great burden, and I hope that I can help him. Edgar and Greta have both sought forgiveness for their elopement, and I can only hope that they find it. The 17th of June, 1284 The skies today are plum-colored in the night, like the heavens are bloodied with war. A storm is on the horizon, they say by the docks over the lowlands. The peasant children have been playing outside less as the chill winds blow. This is strange so early on in the year. The Geith farm has been completely threshed, and the church waved its sass for the year. The peasants have taken to love their lord when they are given plenty. 
The mayor's confession was not more damning than any old lord's. Woman and wine, frivolity, and the occasional man in the old townhouse guest halls. My place is not to judge. But this is a man of too many vices to lead so virtuous a town. But his next words were what troubled me. He spoke of a sea of black coming down from the mountains and unto our houses, washing away the model, chipping at these stone mills, tearing the flesh from bone in the living. It was a vision in green, father, like watching paintings spring to life in polished green stone, striated and striped with darker shades of these same dang strokes. I felt as if I was standing before it, and its light was darkness and its shadow was light, and nothing was as it should be. But all through this, that dang sea ate and ate, and there was nothing there but the bones of children and the wood of cherished little houses, standing like skeletons in the dark. He had turned to me, opened the booth door, and sprang out. When I came out of mine, he looked frightened. This is the dream of an overworked mind, son, not a vision of heaven or hell. There is nothing you need to think at length about. The mare scuttled off after this, and my thoughts since then have been beset with unrest. The 27th of June, 1284. The storm seems to have let up after almost two weeks. There is still rain and thunder rings from ashen skies in the west, but it seems to be lessening. The lady bowed and came down from the keep to see us today. She did not want to give confession, but paid generously into our coffers. Instead, she asked me for advice with one of her dreams. When she told me of it, I admit having to grasp at my hands to stop them suddenly shaking. It bore a venomous resemblance to the mare's unholy vision. I dreamt of being consumed in a shadow, father, of being eaten whole from the toes up. There is but grief and despair throughout the land, and a writhing, a squirmy mess of whatever it was that feasted on our flesh, and ate of our crops and turned the very soil thick and viscous, and green, and a cursed veneer that clung to the shadows like wet soak on the wrist. I told her of the Lord in that it may have been but a vivid imagination roused after stories of war and famine in the heartland. She did not seem satisfied, but bid her farewells and laughed, her carriage rattling across the rain, lightning framing it by the gray sky. The 13th of July, 1284 The rain has not let up. I have asked for the records of the hall scribes from decades before, and I looked through them. No year has seen almost a month of rain in the last half century. Hamlin has prospered on the backs of its farms and the fields are beaten down and overrun, nary able to grow more than a tenth of the weeds that they are able to. No one is starving yet, and the tithe fault is yet to be open, but I pray that it stays that way. Heinrich the blacksmith has asked to be baptized again. I will not turn him down, but he's an honest man who lives by the sweat of his brow and I see no need for him to want to turn a new leaf. The 14th of July, 1284 Some strange evil has beset this town. I am not alone in the church, and my ministers live in the quarters on the ground. Yet I shake as I write these. My quill is broken and jagged, and the ink is spilled into my sheets for the night. When I was casting young Heinrich into the basin, he told me that he was glad to get a second life, because the devil had had him in the last. When I pushed him to elaborate, he told me what I wish I would never have to hear again. I have been having these dreams for a month, father. Wicked, wicked dreams. The place is Hamlin, but it is not now. The trees are dead and gray. The blossoms that would litter the streets are dead and dismal. But I am running up those paths one among a thronging mass of tens of thousands. I am as a beast. I hunger for flesh to feed me and feed my kindred, and I tear apart the children and women before me with my jaws. We are as one, a flood, the very machination of hell itself, and we sought only to devour that accursed green-clad world. I had only barely managed to keep from retching until he and his kin left the pews. 
the 22nd of July, 1284. The rain is carried on now for two score days. The fields are left to the elements, drowning. The streets are now slush and carriages dare not come this way. The tax collector sent a word saying they would collect in the province later. The tithe vault has been opened. The lords have taken nine-tenths of the grain and left the rest for the peasants. The world has fallen so far in a month. Skies like stone. Oh, how I wish they could part for the sun just once. The 29th of July, 1284. Seven more of the small folk have had these same dreams now. I dare say a lot more have had it too, but are unwilling to step forward and ask for the Lord to help with the nightmare. Every confession I hear makes me want to walk away, from my station, from my parish. It's the same every time. A green-tinted dream of a dark sea of pestilence devouring all that we hold dear. I know not to explain this to the Holy Father in my prayer. How can I put into words the horror of this? What do I pray for? That they not dream. That this infernal rain lets up. That the world goes back to normal. The 4th of August, 1284. Heinrich turned up at the church at midnight. He was in a daze. Eyes glazed over like a pierced doe in a royal hunt. He knocked thrice. And when my ministers opened the door, he walked in and climbed the crucifix, soiling the collections with his bare feet. On the stained glass window near the ceiling, he kept a single piece of green stone shaped into something. It was a skillfully crafted sculpture of a throne, on a bed of green carved out to represent undulating waves. The stone itself looked old, like nothing I had seen in the town itself, even in the houses of the lords. It was cool to the touch, and covered in dark striations that sprang from within, like the offshoots of some irreverent creeper. God help us, said Heinrich. We gathered around him, his glazed eyes now furtive, awake, scanning the room. He shivered, drenched in cold. It walks before him. It walks these lands. And it always has. He passed out after this. The town's psychic was awakened and carted him through the slush and sludge, but medicine could not return him to what he had lost. There is no reason or rationale in him anywhere. They were gone as a straw man in a storm. The 9th of August, 1284. The villagers now know of these shared dreams. I do not know who chose to speak of it first, but it has spread like wildfire across the town. The mayor himself was convened to meet of the peoples, and counsel has been sought from the church. The baron has not yet been alerted, but it was only a matter of time. The town hall was a susurrus of whispers, reflective and pensive, bound by the minds of men and the marbled walls. One by one, the small folk told of their dreams, and the mood in the room grew more and more terse. Green worlds, throngs of devilish creatures, a sea that swallowed you and left clanging, clattering bones in its frenzied wake. Twenty people talked, and then fifty, and then a hundred. By sundown, 224 people had confessed to having the same dream. While outside, the rain pattered against the gables and dripped past the red roofing tiles. I could see the mayor's hands shaking as he discussed with his aides. He called me into the circle and asked me about what I thought. Is this devilry, father? Are we lost from the gates of heaven and left on this earth to be tortured in fitful sleep and waking nightmares? I shook my head. There are God-fearing men here. Men with wives and families that have never raised a weapon in war or a voice in violence. They are penitent and there is no more sin in them than in me. I can abide no thoughts of the demonary of hell afflicting my parish. And I couldn't. What this was, this unholy weather, these accursed dreams were of something else, some woeful creation that man was never meant to truly comprehend. The 20th of August, 1284 Everyone has had this dream but me. Everyone, my ministers, the tailors, farmers, tax collectors, all save me. 
I have had to pretend twice that I too have dreamt of the same. I have lied in the house of the Lord, and I know not else that I could have done. Perhaps I am the source of all of this. Perhaps I have displeased him, and this is my punishment, the suffering of my flock. I do not understand it. I wish to get away from here, from the rain and these cursed nightmares. Food has run out almost completely, and bread and water are all that remains. The cattle have been butchered, for they cannot be fed any longer, and the lords have kept the meat for themselves. I have seen two men die of starvation to make sure their families could see the end of the month. At night, if you listen past the din of the downpour, you can hear the cries of a hundred hungry children. The 9th of August, 1284 Forty people have died, mostly men. Their wives and children left in the sludge and muck of the incessant rain. They died from the cold and the wet and the hunger that bites at my bones harder than the cold winds when it flows into my robes. The bread is gone. The dreams have only gotten worse in everyone, and people are frightened to sleep. They are haggard, bed raggled, all in the span of a few months. Several attempts have been made to reach the nearby villages. The mayor sent one of his aides himself with a letter to the baron, begging for aid, but it never reached him. The aide came back a few hours later, confused and hysterical, talking about how he had walked away from the town for half a day, only to find himself suddenly back at its limits like he had never left. The rain made everything beyond the town gates nigh invisible, like shadows behind a thick sheet of silk. I pray now for a quick end to a servant who has looked over his flock for ever so long. The 17th of August, 1284 Oh, woe is us! He lies in his palace of green, his servants, seven unknown, untold, unfound, unheeded, untamed. Yaskar! Yaskar comes, he heralds the king, he heralds the king. The Pantheon rises. The 18th of August, 1284. My mind is no longer my own. What I wrote last day was not of my making, and I cannot recall it. I fear this is our undoing. I tried running into the woods today, but after almost an hour I found myself on the church's front porch again. This is witchery that will have us all. I have no family, none to share these last moments with. I am alone, as the lone bird in winter skies. Old man Gerb by the barn has died today, after speaking the terrors of his newest dreams. He comes, he is here, he who lays the way and he whom he serves. The Malachite quakes and rises, and the tide shall wash man from the earth, as we would kill fish on the sea shredded rock. Something is coming. The skies are darker in the east, almost at night. The winds blowing from within there are fell, evil. I can smell it. The 29th of August, 1284 What I might write down here, I write only in hope that the future knows what happened. I know not if this will ever be read, but I can only hope. For the sum total of the learning of man cannot spawn enough comprehension for what passed in Hamlin, and what will come to pass. The stars in the sky may one day be charted, the seas conquered, and the minds of men enlightened. Yet nothing will grasp what we saw. Last night, well after moonrise, the rain stopped. It did not dissipate or slow down. It stopped. The way you may stop the river with embankment built high and wide, suddenly and out of thin air. There are those who swear they saw drops of water suspended in the air, like pearls glistening in the moonlight. While the townsfolk came outside their homes, drawing in their threadbare, so tides closer, something came in from the east. I do not know how to truly describe that which should not exist, that vies against creation. It was tall, taller than me by many heads, taller than any man I have ever seen. There is no skin to be seen, only a dark shadow across its body, as if shrouded in some ever-moving, ever-shifting cloak. I could not see its legs and nor its face, if it had one. On its back, I could see what seemed like a horn carved from green stone that sparkled in the night. It glided across the wet mud like varnish on wooden pallets. In the distance, 
I could hear deep, rumbling drums, like thunder striking the hearts of old mountains. Every single onlooker stood in silence, either frozen with fear or wrapped with curiosity. It moved slowly, deliberately, until it reached me. And then it stopped over me, a shadow thrice my size, blotting out the moon. The world was the deathly still, and I closed my eyes for what felt like eternity. When I opened them again, it had moved past me. The whole town seemed to be in a daze. The whites of their eyes bulging out of their sockets, miles open, the same as Heinrich on that fateful night. My terror had finally taken the better of my reason, and I knelt and threw up, and cried on my own sick until the rain splashed down again and it washed away. I came to my senses with the mare slapping me awake. They pulled me to my feet, and I saw that they were in tears, stricken with fear and grief. What happened? What did you see? I cried. He showed us what is to happen. The herald showed us the way that is yet to come. We stand at its very center. The center of what? What do you speak of? I was crying again. My mind adrift with thoughts of hell and heaven, and things of neither domain. The mayor's voice grew deeper, quieter. He is almost upon the land. The accursed king. The herald told us that the world would run amok, overburdened by a sea of devils and derogation. That would kill us all. None would stay alive. Not a single Saxon soul would stay alive. Vardiathowit, the accursed king, the accursed king, screamed one of the villagers, and he knelt down and spread the wet mud on his face and neck. He will be the end to us all, unless, unless... The mayor completed his delirious words with a desperate plea in his eyes. Unless we pay his tribute. A mother from the back pushed her way past the mayor. I knew her. She had lost her suckling babe only a week ago, and her young son stayed sleeping in her home. Only you can choose whether we should do it, father. You didn't dream, he said. Only you can make the choice free from knowing the nightmare that might follow if you choose wrong. Those were his words. But what does he want? What does he want, this cursed thing? I cried out, wringing my hands in despair. Our future, she said, her voice like cold forged iron. And with that, I knew what tribute was needed. I wanted to run again, past the woods, past the old oak, and into the bear pits, to end myself, to end my fear and my deepest horrors. But I simply couldn't bring myself to. I looked at them, mothers, fathers, distraught, devastated, changed forever, yet aware of what was to be done. They said that I have to decide on my own. If any of them were to aid me, nothing would change. And decided I have. The 26th of August, 1284. The last three weeks have had no rain. The clouds lifted the day I made my decision, and whispered it into the green stone throne that Heinrich had brought into the church. The sun shone down, and the waters receded suddenly, as if it pulled away like puppets on strings. I pay no mind to the supernatural anymore. I have witnessed more of it than many men can dream of in their most intimately disturbing nightmares. Today is St. John and Paul's Day, one of the happiest days of the year, marked off by many months before it rolled around. The church's stained glass window would have been adorned with decorations. It was a day of celebration, but there was none to be seen now. Only mothers crying, only fathers stifling their tears, only the ending of a hundred bonds over the command of something that creation had little to say over. Only the wailing of those who would lose the last iotas of light that kept them alive through months of absolute, unutterable despair. As the promised hour came to a close, I heard drums beating in the east. A fell wind blew in, and in the distance, something entered the twilight shadows, playing a green horn that sounded at once like heaving waves, rustling leaves in the broiling rush of an avalanche. Like war, like the rumbling of a wound-up catapult, like death, and a hundred little feet pattered behind it, entranced. 
the log ends here. I checked up on my facts again before committing the story to be transcribed and found a lot that seemed to match up. The tale of the Pied Piper of Hamelin came about in 1284 AD. It told of the piper leading away rats, an evident, inescapable reference to the Great Plague. But what has always been considered odd in the European folklore community is that the Black Death didn't start till almost 50 years later, in 1328. Yet the story originated when it did. In fact, there is even a stained glass window in the erstwhile town church of Hamelin depicting the events of the story, none of which would have been possible if the plague had not even started yet. However, after reading the father's journal, I believe I may have an answer. You see, the story of the piper ends with a very specific little detail. It says that there were two children who were saved, because they could not follow him like the other children did. One was a little girl who was deaf and could not hear the music. The other was a boy with deformed legs who could not keep up with the group. The piper never did get all the children like he had wanted to. And maybe because of that, what should have happened instead only became a temporary reprieve. Instead of removing the Black Death from the annals of history, all they could do was postpone it by half a century. Whatever the Herald was, his loyalty lay with something else. And its wrath is what the world felt when the plague killed a third of all who were alive then. To this day, there is a street in Hamelin associated with the Pied Piper. It is said to be where the children were last seen, rushing happily into the west, enchanted by an otherworldly melody. That street is, and has always been called, Bungalow Sinstrasse.